Good afternoon. My name is Tamara Loss, and I'm the Tony Rimby Dean of the University of Washington School of Law. And it was my great pleasure and honor to be with you this afternoon and to welcome you here to William H. Gates Hall, but more importantly, to this important ceremony that we're going to have with our distinguished justice, Justice Yu. And it's my privilege and honor to introduce her. And it's such a thrill to, to be in the state of Washington and to know her. Um, I was invited to actually have an audience with the uh, Florida State Supreme Court on Bonk, and it was a very engaged dialogue largely because of Justice Yu. I was able to engage with her at the Washington Leadership Institute with her work, um, ground, groundbreaking work and grassroots work with training lawyers. And so um, it's an honor and a privilege as I, as I feel that I'm speaking of a living legend. And you'll know a lot more why I say that as I go through some of her many accomplishments. Actually, more than I could ever say today, so please um, know, uh, Justice Yu, that I'm not skipping over anything, <laughs> but I'm just giving the highlights because your, your record is, is so extremely prestigious. As I was um, even looking at the number of awards, uh, anyone um, would be, um, I guess, honored to have been named the of the year just once. But Justice Yu has been named, I believe, of the year of every category of her career, and then more than once in, in various, of those various of those categories by various groups in the bench and bar. And I think that also speaks volumes for Justice Yu, that she is a community in, uh, builder um, and an engaged leader. And we all strive to be that. And each of you, as you um, embark in this area of the law and the clinic, um, I think are, are striving to do that, to impact the community. And that's what the University of Washington is all about. Um, Justice Yu was first appointed to the Washington Supreme Court on May 16, 2014. Um, she is the first Asian, the first Latina, and the first member of the LGBTQ community to serve on the Washington State Supreme Court. Prior, um, Justice Yu spent 14 years as an accomplished trial judge in King County Sup Superior Court, and she presided over a wide variety of cases, criminal, civil, and juvenile. Also, prior to that, she, was, she served as a deputy um, prosecutor and doing criminal and civil division. And before going to law school, she worked in the Peace and Justice Office for the Archdiocese of Chicago. She has an extreme breadth of experience and also dedicated to service, as I mentioned, um, mentoring young lawyers, young law clerks, co-chairing various initiatives um, for minority communities and the Justice Commission. I could go on and on for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I won't do that. I will give the floor to our esteemed justice, Justice Yu. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Justice. Great. I think they were we're going to try using the southern microphone. I think that's going to work. So first of all, thank you, Dean, for the nice introduction. And um, I appreciate being here. And I, what I'd like to say to all of you is, because you might not know it, is there's a lot of excitement about your new dean. Um, we're very excited in the legal community and in the courts uh, because of who she is. Um, it's nice to actually provide refuge from anybody leaving the state of Florida uh, to come to Washington State. <laughs> Um, we're really happy with your dean and the new dean at Seattle University School of Law. I mean, it provides a unique opportunity, right, to, to step back for a moment and ask what's the relevance of the law schools in the state of Washington, and more importantly, for the court, 
uh, it's an opportunity to continue to wrestle with the question of, right, how do you prepare somebody to practice law? It's not just come in and learn some cases and be able to understand the principles of law. That's really important. But there's a broader perspective um, that I invite you to think about in terms of your profession. And we will invite the law schools to think about is the formation or the vocation of a lawyer is more than just analyzing the law, right? It's really about serving your clients, even though it may be a business or maybe you're working for the government or a not-for-profit entity. But the most important thing is you are providing a service to a community who is in need. Because people don't come to us lawyers when they're happy and everything is great and they don't have a problem. They come to us when there's a problem. And that could be just the formation of a business, or it really could be how to not get caught when you're polluting the waters, or perhaps it's a difficult divorce, or maybe you've been charged with a crime that you haven't committed. The range, right, of problems that our clients face are, are so important to them. And if you've ever been in a legal crisis yourself, the only thing you want to be able to do is to place it into somebody's hands that you can trust, right? That you assume they're competent. You assume that they know the law or how to find the law, but the really hard thing is, right, can I trust them to really represent my interests? Can I trust this person to hold what is near and dear to me close to their heart? And to be thinking about me when they're making decisions as an attorney about strategy, availability, or even billing. Right, there's a layer there that you almost can't touch. And it really just has to do with something more with our character, with who we are as people, with our morals, with our sense of what's right and wrong. And I guess I just invite you, wherever you are in your legal career now, is to keep that in mind, is to regularly come back and reflect on the vocation of being a lawyer and how you're different than any other profession that is licensed. You're not there to fix the pipe and leave or repair the car and send it out of the garage. You're in a relationship of trust. There's a fiduciary duty you have. There's something more about your relationship with your clients and the people you serve than almost any other profession. And perhaps the one that comes close might be a doctor, right? The level of trust and what's required of us as lawyers going forward. And I ask you again, reflect on that for the rest of your life. What does it mean to be a lawyer in the state of Washington? I hope that the answer that comes back, right, is that you will always be known as a person of integrity and with incredible character. So I want to start there because that's to the whole group of lawyers, right, in terms of who we are and why having a new dean provides a new opportunity to ask how this law school will help form future lawyers who will be distinguished by their character. What a great opportunity. And that's what we'll be asking the new deans to help us think about and for us to help this law school uh, build lawyers with character. So aside from that, here I am. I'm so delighted to be here that we finally figured out a date um, where I could do this swearing in. At first, I suggested, well, maybe a trial court judge who lives nearby might be the best thing. And I got this pushback. No! <laughs> um, why the pushback? Right? Why does your professor want a Supreme Court justice here to administer this oath? And it's not because we're friends, and it's not because of me but it's because of how important today is. And it's because of how important the work that you do is. It's not trivial. It's not something that's everyday kind of thing. You already separate yourself from your other classmates. Because when you decide to be involved and take a class or to do something for credit in a legal clinic, you are the ones who are making the connection right, between lawyering and service. You are the one who says, in order to learn how to be a good lawyer, 
I need to learn how to be a good lawyer. And you're not going to learn it from books alone. You're going to learn it when you're being mentored. You're going to learn it in a very safe environment. You're going to learn about the reality of legal services in the state of Washington. And that is that the people you serve will never be able to afford your services into the future. That's the truth, is you are providing, for the most part, services to people who will never be able to afford your advice once you leave here. And that's not to say that you should not bill at 500 an hour. That's not to say that you are not worth that, because you are. And we are a service profession, but we're a business. And so it's OK to be compensated for your services. But the fact is, there's a huge, huge gap in the provision of legal services in the state of Washington. And we know that most of the people who walk our streets, who live in our neighborhoods, are people who have problems that are not the large ones that I just described, but sometimes it's just accessing health care. Sometimes it's just trying to figure out their insurance. Sometimes it's just trying to figure out how to not be pushed out of your home. Right? There's a lot of issues that are never going to qualify for anything other than perhaps the mercy of a lawyer who could give them some time. They're not going to be able to afford your legal services to resolve those kind of issues. So being part of a legal clinic is not only about your training, but it's about providing services and filling a gap, sometimes in a very small way, but sometimes in a really big way. Those of you who are helping entities form, right, help somebody form a business, when you own your own business, you're self-sufficient. So even though you might not think it's a big deal, wow, it's a big deal when you help somebody think about how to do that. If somebody's got a tax problem, right, you already know. But if not, you will see the relief that you give when you can ha help somebody through what might be a very small tax problem to you, but a really big problem for them. You fill a gap, a really important gap. And I think these legal clinics are part of this whole notion of formation as a lawyer, right? You understand what it means to practice with other people. You understand what it means to file an amicus with the Supreme Court. And any of you who have been involved with doing that, I can tell you it makes a difference. We get a lot of amicus briefs, and all of us always look at the briefs that include the law schools. If you've been part of that, you make a difference. You are advancing a policy position that the parties often can't. Right? The parties are there to resolve a specific claim, and that's what they care about. But the court wants to know, well, what are the implications of this decision? What are the policy consequences of us giving relief to one party or the other? And the amici are the ones who can answer that question. Here are the consequences. The world will end if you do this, right? Or you will liberate everybody if you do that. We want to know that. We want to hear it. And only lawyers who are serving in that capacity can help us see what are the policy implications of what we do. So what you do here, and I guess this is the whole point, what you do here in legal clinics is really important. It's about good lawyering, and this is how you learn it, by doing it, by actually doing it. The last thing that I will say before I open this up to just a couple of minutes of any questions before we administer the oath, um, is I also like to come to the law schools to try to make a plea. And that's because, as you may know, um, our court is the most diverse court in the nation. And we're very proud of that. It may be the whole world, for all I know. But all I know is, for a fact, we are the most diverse court in the nation. Your dean said I was the first of many categories. The best news is that I'm no longer there by myself, right? There are other women of color there. There's another member of the LGBTQ community there. We have, for the first time in our state's history, a Latino chief justice. Um, how important. And for the rest, right, we still have a white guy. <laughs> He's there. He's there for 30 years, right? Justice Johnson is an incredible constitutional scholar. And if he were standing here next to me, 
he will tell you he never would have dreamt in his whole life that the court would be as diverse as it is. Um, and how proud he is to have walked through that history of seeing how the court has changed and seeing how the conversations have shifted because the presence is different. And how wonderful he is in terms of being a mentor. He would share with you those words of wisdom. So perhaps sometime he might come up here um, and share that with you because it's really living history being told by somebody who's gone through it. So we are the most diverse court in the nation. And I think one of the things that we have done that you have also heard about is, right, is we were also the first court to really recognize that we had a particular responsibility to eradicate racism within our criminal legal system. We were the first to embrace the fact that we as judges and you as lawyers have a special responsibility for seeing racism as it is and for eradicating it from our system so that we might deliver on the promise to every single person that they could come into our courts and really believe that we could deliver justice. You know, I know, we are not doing that right now. We don't do it for a large part of our population. And we finally embrace the fact, right, that the majority of the people who we're incarcerating are from the BIPOC community, right? We incarcerate people of color at a higher rate than anywhere in the world. And we said, we have a responsibility to fix that. And we intend to do it. And we have been doing it. And some people are unhappy about it, but I got to tell you, the majority of people are pretty darn happy that we had the courage to take on this hard work to make our system a better system of justice. So I'm here to ask you to join me in that. We don't do this alone. You are part of the judicial branch. When you are going to be coming members of the bar, I hope you will stay in the state of Washington and practice here. You are members of the judicial branch. You're not in the executive branch. You're not in the legislative branch. We are responsible for your admission, suspension, disbarment. You are within our branch. And we can't do any of what we want to do without you. We need you. We need you to start now. And we need you to take on this cause of justice in your practice. And so. That doesn't mean that everybody has to go and be a public defender or prosecutor. That's the real misconception about what it means to take on this work. Taking on this work means taking this mission wherever you go, to corporate boardrooms, to in-house counsel, to corporate transactions. Whatever you do, wherever you go, there's going to be the opportunity to advance the idea of justice to address the question, the real question, of how do I eradicate racism. You will benefit more than anybody from a system of justice. You have a responsibility to make it fair for everyone. And I ask you to please join us in doing that. Your clinical experience will give you that context to take it forward for the rest of your life. And I just ask, don't ever forget it. Encourage other people to follow in your footsteps and do the same. And I'm convinced, as our court is, that we can move that dial the other way towards justice, towards really, really making a difference in people's lives and advancing change on behalf of those without power. So that's the ask. That's the serious message. Um, I'll open this up for just a couple of minutes of Q&A. And then I just want to say, this is what good lawyers will always do, is you've got to have the disclaimer, or you've got to have a caveat. So in administering this oath, I don't want anybody to think that you are now licensed to practice law. <laughs> right? You are taking this oath to practice under the supervision of your professors, under the supervision of this law school, and yet with all authority right, to work with a client and to represent a client's needs. But I also wouldn't want anybody to think that I am here circumventing any of the rules in regard to the practice of law and the graduation requirements. And I don't know where you are in your academic career, but if there's a bar exam still, then passage of the bar exam. 
Um, and I said that if, because we are really studying it, and we are looking at what is the best way to determine whether somebody's qualified to practice in the state of Washington. Um, we do have a lot of people who say, I had to do it, they got to do it. Um, and all we want to know is, what's the best indicator of really um, somebody's fitness to practice law? So we're looking at that. Justice Montoya Lewis uh, is chairing a um, study group, and we're going to welcome everybody's input. And it's a serious question uh, that nobody will be happy with the answer, but just know it's an honest inquiry. <laughs> okay, Kim, uh, is it okay to do that? We'll just. So I'm happy to take any questions from you, comments, um, anything you want to know about the court, anything about what I said, and if there are none, that's okay. My feelings will not be hurt, but I want you to know um, that I am here also to answer any questions you might have. Yeah, I, I'd say um, <laughs> what, what I carry forward is, you know, I'm still suffering from PTSD from law school. <laughs> and um, because it wasn't the most positive experience. I went to the University of Notre Dame Law School. And it's an excellent law school. Uh, the at the time that I went there, we didn't have clinical programs. So we didn't have outlets for uh, other interests, or there was no sense that you could begin to try some things. So that, that's why it was really a very negative experience. And all opinions were not welcome. Um, and so I felt that professors had a broader responsibility to foster diverse thinking. And that didn't happen. So that was part of the negative aspects of my experience. And yet at the same time, I would say I love statutory construction. I love um, looking at codes. I like working uh, with the law when it's very simple in some ways. And I will attribute that to my law school in terms of some great classes, right, in UCC and the federal tax code. And those were classes that I loved. And I would say that's where I first learned that, right? It's very simple. It's a methodology for practice. Law school is not supposed to teach you substantive knowledge because everything changes. But how to approach it is extraordinary. And that, to me, is the relevance of this to practice. That is the most important thing that you can get is, how do I learn to attack the law in the sense of understanding it? Um, and that's the best thing that you could get from law school right now that will make you very successful in the future. If you can just know this is the method for attacking it, figuring it out, undoing it, reversing it, changing it. Um, that, to me, uh, is, is really what I would say hang on to. And if you can take any classes that will help you do that, rather than the classes that are just interesting out of personal interest, take them. Um, the personal interest will always be there. And that's not to bash those classes, because those are really important to keep you energized and sustained. And to love the law, you will have to find something that you're passionate about. But I would say those classes that can teach you linear thinking, and maybe it's because I wasn't one, um, that that will benefit you forever. It just will. I hope that answered the question. It's kind of long. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you. That's a great question. You know, I think probably the message or the thing that has got me this far is take risks, believe in yourself, and don't let anybody count you out. I, I really mean that. I grew up in a lower working class neighborhood of Chicago to undocumented immigrant parents um, who eventually became documented uh, because it was important for them to vote. We did not have resources. We didn't have a whole lot. So dreaming about law school right, was just not there for me as a child, as a young girl, as a teenager. That just wasn't 
there because I didn't know anybody who had a college degree. And what I learned um, through that life experience is don't count yourself out because the temptation for us is to step back rather than to step forward. And I would say that, you know, even women of color today, what we still tend to do is step back and say, not me. Uh, because maybe stepping forward is more difficult than anything else uh, because of barriers and obstacles and our own lack of confidence. Um, I am here not because I dreamt about it. I am here because opportunity came up and I had the tenacity to go forward. It was scary. I never knew. Um, but have the courage to step forward and take a risk. Absolutely take a risk. Take a risk on yourself. The fact that you're here means that you're competent, able, talented. This law school doesn't admit everybody. They admitted you. You belong here. You're here. You belong in our profession. And I want you to believe in yourself. And I don't want you to shut the door and leave and be discouraged. We're going to have ups and downs. But the one thing I would say is every failure is an opportunity. And so when somebody says no and you don't get that job offer, there's going to be another one that's going to come, right? And even though there might be an offer that just seems so crazy and impossible and yet it feeds something in you and you get a little flutter and just do it. Just do it, right? It's, you don't have to do it forever. Do it. Take chances. Take risks. Take the chance that you love it and if you don't, you can just leave and do something different. Don't get bogged down. But more importantly, please believe in yourself, your talent, um, and that you belong here. That, that is what I want you to, to know, believe in, and take with you forever. Forever and ever and ever. Don't leave the profession, please. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, and that's, it's scary. That's a temptation, right, that people become non-people or numbers or who cares. And I would say that's not even something that's unique to the legal profession. I think it's to all of us in our society right now, right, is how to not be a cynic, how to not shut down um, and protect yourself. Um, and what you end up giving up is compassion. And it's hard. It's hard to continue to be vulnerable. It's hard to continue to feel pain. Um, and yet, I'm very proud of the fact that when I, our juvenile cases, I don't win every case, right? But my heart goes out to every single one of them, regardless of how awful they may have uh, been at some point in their life, is the ability to have an open heart is hard. It's an exercise. It's like meditation and yoga. If you don't do it, you lose it. Right? And this is exercise in love, exercise in mercy, exercise in seeing somebody else as a human being. And I'll just tell you, there's a really great book uh, that's worth reading called The Road to Character. Uh, the New York Times, oh, it's not coming to mind. He's um, Brooks. Uh, he's always on PBS. He used to represent the Republican view. He writes for the New York Times, uh, David Brooks. But he wrote a book. Um, entitled The Road to Character. And <clears throat> what he said, you know, when you look at your life, and this was a reflection of where he was in his life, because everything fell apart. Um, and he just said, you know, so many of us go through life putting together our resume, right? We work really hard, and we think we're building character by adding more awards or doing all these things, and you have all this stuff. And he just said, what about if you lived your life in a way that's called the eulogy life, right? What would they say about you at your eulogy? What would they say? Are they going to get up and say, well, they did this, they did that? Wouldn't you like at your eulogy for somebody to get up and say, gosh, they were really kind. And gosh, they were really forgiving. And do you know what they did every night on Sunday night is they would take out their garbage of their neighbors and put it on the curb. 
because the elderly lady couldn't do it very well. If they did this for 25 years, I mean, wouldn't you want somebody to define your character in that way rather than what you've accumulated in your career? This book is tremendous. If you have a chance to read it, you can check it out in the library, you can download it. But what it is is insight into how important it is, is to maintain a certain character in order to remain human. And it's a little roadmap to how to do that. Um, and I would encourage you to take a look at that because it's not easy. And especially today, right, I would like to be the cynic about people who don't agree with me politically. I want to dismiss them. I want to talk about how small the brain is. I want to talk about all the things they didn't get, which is why they're so filled with hatred. Well, what I'm doing is demonizing them in the way that I don't want to be, right? How do we get into the exercise of recognizing differences, um, even if I think it's harmful? It's hard, but it's an exercise that I think you need to take on from the very get-go, um, is to keep yourself in check, to keep your heart open, to remain vulnerable, and remain able to love. And I think you'll be able to do that with your clients. You always want to separate press, personal and professional, but I think compassion is so important. That's just such a great question. But right, I think I probably should stop, put on my robe. Um, thank you for this conversation. Uh, <laughs> So let me ask, do people have copies of the oath that we're going to? No. OK. That's OK. Because then I'm going to ask everybody from each group, and I, will, I promise I will feed it in short segments. It will not be a paragraph. Um, I will be asking each of the groups then that we ask uh, to take the oath to raise your right hand. Um, and at a place where you state your name, I want you to state your full legal name. But we'll do this all together. Um, so the first one will be the oath of attorney. It's very, very long. And if you haven't read it, you should read it at some point. You'll study it in, in the professional um, rules class. And our court has been asked a million times to shorten it. They just like make it three sentences or a paragraph. Or do like California, right? It's three sentences and you sign a card. And we're not going to do that uh, because we believe that this lengthy, lengthy oath embodies the things that I have just talked about in terms of who you are as an attorney um, and the character that you must carry with you. So all those who are going to be taking the oath of attorney, I'm going to ask you to stand up. Anybody not in the mediation place, please stand up. The mediators are going to have their own oath, but all the lawyers who are So everybody who's not doing the mediation should be standing and raise your right hand, OK? And again, I'll ask you to repeat after me. I, and then state your full legal name. I. Do solemnly declare. Do solemnly declare. I, am I am fully subject to the laws of the state of Washington and the laws of the United States, and, the laws of the States. And, will and will abide by the same. I will support the Constitution of the State of Washington and the Constitution of the United States. I will abide by the rules of professional conduct approved by the Supreme Court Court of the State of Washington. I will maintain the respect due to the courts of justice and judicial officers. I will not counsel or maintain any suit or proceeding 
which shall appear to me to be unjust or any defense, or any defense. Except, as except as I believe to be honestly debatable under the law, unless it is in defense of a person charged with a public offense. I will employ, for the purpose of maintaining the causes confided to me, only those means consistent with truth and honor. I will never seek to mislead the judge or jury by any artifice or false statement. I will maintain the confidence and preserve inviolate the secrets of my client. And will, accept no and will accept no compensation in connection with the business of my client, of my client. unless this compensation is from, this compensation is from or, with the and of the or with the knowledge and approval of the client, or with the approval of the court. Of the court. I will abstain from all offensive personalities, from all personalities and, advance no fact and advance no fact prejudicial to the honor, to the honor or, reputation or reputation of a party or witness, party or witness unless, required unless required by the justice of the cause, the of the cause with which I am charged. I will never reject, will never reject from, any from any consideration, personal to myself, personal the, cause of the, the cause of the defenseless, or oppressed, or, oppressed, or, delay, unjustly, or delay unjustly the cause of any person. Of any person. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have had the Q&A after this, right? So you could say, what do you mean by that? OK. Let's do the oath of mediator. Not as long, but as important. All right, you who are quasi-judicial officers here, right? OK, raise your right hand. I, and then state your full legal name. Do solemnly declare, I will uphold the highest standards of professionalism in all mediation settings. I will perform my duties as a mediator impartially by remaining neutral towards the participants at all times. If at any time I feel unable to conduct the mediation in an independent, neutral, and impartial way, I will express that concern to the parties and will offer to withdraw from the mediation. I will remain aware of the social and economic differences that exist among participants and treat participants and bar members with patience and respect. I will conduct mediations without exhibiting bias or prejudice based on race, sex, religion, national origin, disability, 
age, sexual orientation or identity, or other similar factors. I will keep confidential all information acquired by me in the course of a mediation, except in the limited circumstances permitted under my code of professional ethics. I will maintain this duty of confidentiality as a continuing obligation throughout the mediation process and after my appointment as mediator ends. Right. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Yu, for all your remarks, your staying and taking questions, and your administration of the oath. Not only did you get all that, but now you get even more. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to call up each clinic in alphabetical order. I apologize for those at the bottom of the alphabet. Um, and you're going to have an opportunity to introduce yourselves to Justice Yu, tell her a little bit about the work you're doing in the clinic, and then we'll take each clinic will have a photo with uh, the justice. So we're starting with the appellate advocacy, the smallest of the crew. 